Okay, so it's 3.30, so um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for attending our first New Frontier Zoom webinar of the year. Um, today, we're honored to introduce Dr. Shendar Sai from St. Jude uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, he is an assistant member in the Department of Hematology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. His research lab focuses on developing genome editing technologies for therapeutics. His group has recently developed ChangeSeq, a state-of-the-art sensitive, unbiased, high-throughput method for defining the genome-wide activity of genome editors. He completed his postdoctoral fellowship at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in functional genomics and his uh, Sorry, he completed his PhD and master's um, at North Carolina State University and in 2020 was chosen as one of the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy Outstanding New Investigators. He is co-chair of the steering committee of the NIH Somatic Cell Genome Editing Consortium. He has a long list of really great publications. Sounds like he has a tremendous training environment in his lab there at St. Jude. Um, and is doing some really important work about uh, with genome editing and trying to treat some serious diseases. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let the presentation begin. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks very much, Jamie, for the, for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm really honored to be here today to speak to you guys about um, CRISPR genome editing for sickle cell disease therapies. So I'm going to break my talk today into two major parts, um, one on the therapeutics um, itself, and second on the state-of-the-art under, state understanding of safety of these approaches. So my lab works on genome editing technologies towards therapeutics, um, and so we're all very excited about the promise of genome editing technologies for therapies. This includes conditions like Huntington's, cystic fibrosis, the Shane's muscular dystrophy, hemophilia, um, uses for cancer immunotherapy, um, and for our particular interest in sickle cell disease. I think the reason that we and many others are so excited about these approaches is that there's the potential for curative genetic therapies. So this means that we can really treat the underlying genetic causes of disorders rather than simply their symptoms. There are a number of different classes of genome editors. These include meganucleases and finger nucleases, talons and CRISPR-Cas nucleases. So I actually started working in the field of genome editing, it's hard to believe, around 10 years ago. I started at the intersection between what are known as zinc finger nucleases and talons. These are uh, proteins that can be engineered to target specific sites in the genome and introduce targeted double-stranded breaks. Um, they were a little bit harder to engineer and so more recently, there's been tremendous interest in um, a class of editors called CRISPR-Cas editors. And these also encompass a number of different uh, types of editing technology from nucleases, base editors, transposes, and prime editors. And we'll talk about the first couple of those later on in my talk. I think most of you by now have probably heard about CRISPR-Cas genome editors. They've really been quite transformative for genome editing. So they were first discovered as a yogurt uh, in yogurt bacterium, and they're a two-component system composed of Cas9 protein that's associated with a short guide RNA. And they've been a really simple and robust technology for both research and therapeutics. I think what's really exciting about CRISPR-Cas technologies is the simplicity with which they can be programmed. So those earlier technologies that I told you about, like zinc finger nucleases and talons. You know, these are also very powerful genome editing technologies, but the challenge is that you needed to engineer new proteins for every single target site um, that you'd like to modify. And so what was really transformative about CRISPR-Cas genome editors is, is that their targeting specificity is mostly controlled by interactions between this short associated guide RNA and target DNA. So most of the specificity is mediated by RNA to DNA interactions, although there is you know, some degree of specificity controlled by the protein itself. And so Cas9 um, can recognize um, what's called a protospacer adjacent motif or PAM sequence in the genome. In the case of this commonly used Cas9, it's NGG. Um, and then you can have the short associated guide RNA 
that can recognize its target by RNA DNA complementarity. By simply changing this five prime 20 base pairs of the guide RNA, you can completely reprogram it to target new sites. And so you can see here on the right that you know there has been, of course, tremendous excitement and now recently recognition of CRISPR genome editing as Jennifer Doudna and Imana Charpentier shared the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. So these targeted double stranded breaks induced by, by CRISPR Cas9 can be repaired by competing DNA damage repair pathways. And so in the classic editing context, you have a nucleus induced double strand break um, created by Cas9, for example. And these double stranded breaks can be repaired by pathways that include either non homologous unjoining, which is often used um, to create variable length insertion or deletion mutations for gene knockout, um, or homology directed repair, which in the presence of a user supplied donor template, you can make precise sequence modifications of interest. And so this is often used for gene correction. We're in a really interesting time. I feel for genome editing therapies. We're really in this era of new genomic medicines. So there are examples such as for sickle cell disease, um, editing of BCL11A and human hematopoietic stem cells it's being done by a company CRISPR Therapeutics and Vertex um, for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Um, some in vivo genome editing um, by Intellia Therapeutics Editas Medicine for conditions like transthyretin amyloidosis, Bieber congenital amaurosis, which is a rare form of childhood blindness. And we have work um, that we've been working on for treatment of sickle cell disease. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about our efforts. So sickle cell disease, as many of you might know, is a genetic condition due to a point mutation in the gene that includes uh, beta globin, which is a component of uh, hemoglobin. It's associated with severe pain, chronic anemia, progressive multi-organ failure, and early mortality. And so a lot of Sickle cell patients often have like an average lifespan of around 45 years. There are um, pharmacologic drugs for sickle cell disease, including um, drugs like 4-hydroxyurea, but these drugs are not curative. Uh, there are curative treatments for sickle cell disease. These include allogeneic um, or um, unmatched bone marrow transplant, um, which is curative, but there are a limited number of haploidentical or matched donors um, where the outcomes are really robust. And so at St. Jude in our department, we treat over 900 pediatric sickle cell disease patients. And so the phenotype of sickle cell disease is really caused by abnormal sickling. So this happens because of that point mutation I mentioned to you in HVB. It causes polymerization of the hemoglobin, uh, of hemoglobin uh, under hypoxic conditions. And so you end up with this characteristic red sickling shape um, that clogs the circulation and causes all of these other um, catastrophic downstream um, symptoms. And so the therapeutic vision that we and many share is the concept of autologous cell therapy for treatment of sickle cell disease. And so the idea might be that you'd mobilize human hematopoietic stem cells from sickle cell disease patients. Um, you'd isolate the HSCs. You would deliver the genome editor. And so you would deliver some sort of um, productive genetic modification then you'd introduce these cells back to the patients after uh, some sort of conditioning. The advantage of this is that there's no issue of donor availability. So you don't have to look for exactly um, matched um, sibling or haploidentical donors um, that don't have sickle, um, homozygous sickle allele. It eliminates the risk of graft versus host disease. So some sort of like, you know, immune attack of the transplanted cells on the patient. Um, so if you think about genome editing for sickle cell disease, I think one of the first things that everyone thinks about is the idea that, okay, well, why don't you just directly correct the sickle mutation? Um, and I think that's clearly a good idea, but there are technical challenges, at least with using direct genome editing nucleases for, for that. As I mentioned to you before, nucleus induced double stranded breaks are repaired by these two competing DNA pathways. Um, and non homologous end joining, the one where you can knock out things or get these variable length insertion and deletion mutations, is the most dominant one. It's available during all phases of the cell cycle. Um, and because it competes with homology directed repair, if we're trying to directly correct sickle mutation, you might be able to get about 30% or so of repair outcomes being 
the precise correction that you want, but the dominant repair outcome would be knocking out the beta globin gene. Um, and so you end up with a mixture of the things that you want. Um, when you knock out beta globin, you end up creating an imbalance um, between alpha and beta globin. These are both components of adult hemoglobin. Um, and that imbalance is associated with another disorder that's called beta thalassemia. Um, and so I think the bottom line is that gene correction is an interesting approach, but we can't get all the mutations that we want. Um, and it's technically tricky. So you end up with a lot of unwanted knockout of the gene that you're really trying to correct. Um, so an alternate approach that we and many others have been working on is this idea of inducing fetal hemoglobin as a replacement for defective sickle beta globin. So this is something that's been thought about for quite some time. There's a developmental switch between fetal um, and adult hemoglobin that happens right around the time of birth. And what's important to know is that fetal hemoglobin is anti-cycling. And so in patients with sickle cell disease, they essentially have a backup copy of the, of the beta globin gene um, in fetal hemoglobin, in, which is partially encoded by the gamma globin gene. Um, what's really interesting is that there are patients that have persistent expression of fetal hemoglobin. It's called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, or HPFH. And they have mutations that cause this. And in, in patients that do have HPFH and sickle cell mutation, they seem to be relatively, almost perfectly normal. And so it's been thought for a really long time that if you could just induce fetal hemoglobin, you could uh, potentially have a curative treatment for sickle cell disease. And so the approach that we've been taking is the idea that um, there is genetic control. There's a developmental switch from fetal to adult hemoglobin. And so what if you could manipulate that um, genetic switch. And the idea is that we'd like to disrupt a repressor binding site um, that controls the fetal to adult hemoglobin switch. Um, and so here's the target that we've been working on. So there's a well-known repressor of fetal hemoglobin called BCL11A. Um, uh, knockout of this in a red blood cell, cell specific way is being tested in clinical trials. Um, the approach that we're interested in is knocking out that repressor binding site. And so we're trying to essentially get rid of the site where the repressor binds, which would enable you to reactivate um, fetal hemoglobin or gamma globin. We're doing this by editing of human hematopoietic stem cells at this uh, HBG1, HBG2 promoter. And so here I'm showing you kind of an overview of the experimental design of editing of human hematopoietic stem cells. So as I mentioned, first we mobilize um, these cells from sickle cell disease patients. Um, we're doing this in a clinical trial here at St. Jude, testing the mobilization itself um, using an agent called Plexifor that is able to safely mobilize cells from sickle cell disease patients. This is a clinical trial led by Akshay Sharma here at St. Jude in collaboration with John Tisdale at uh, NHLBI. We mobilize these cells. We collect um, what are known as human CD34 positive. It's a marker for human hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. We stimulate with cytokines. We electroprate with Cas9 ribonucleoprotein complex. So this is a complex of Cas9 and its guide RNA. And then we transplant them into these immune deficient mice. And this experiment overall is designed to analyze genome editing in repopulating human hematopoietic stem cells 16 weeks after transplantation. And so I think the question we're asking is, are we really editing bona fide human hematopoietic stem cells that can repopulate um, the, the blood and the circulation? Um, I think it's kind of challenging to ask that question without transplant because um, human HSCs represent a really small proportion of the cells that we're able to collect, about like perhaps like one in a thousand. And so you really need the transplant setting to be able to see that you have um, bona fide hematopoietic stem cells that can repopulate the bone marrow. Okay, so here I think we're really summarizing um, our studies that have taken probably over a couple of years of optimization to really optimize the editing in HSVs. Um, what we're able to see is in three sickle cell um, disease donors, HSVs from those patients, um, we're able to get high levels of indel mutation, around 80% um, in the bulk pre transplant cell product. When we transplant these into immunodeficient mice, um, we're able to still maintain really high levels of editing. That was a pretty key result 
um, for us because in earlier experiments, we really often saw a drop um, in editing after transplant. So we were pretty gratified to see high levels of editing. We're able to achieve levels of fetal hemoglobin induction of around 30%. Um, and so we think that the threshold to be therapeutic is around 20%. And so this is kind of something that we predict could be therapeutically effective. Um, when we look at whether the red blood cell progeny of the edited HSCs um, have functional reductions in sickling, we can see significant reductions in sickling. And so all of this was you know, pretty encouraging for us in terms of uh, moving forward towards a clinical trial um, of this. Um, there are other approaches towards this that we're taking as well. I think, as I mentioned um, to you, our approach here, we're disrupting the gamma globin promoter. So we're trying to induce fetal hemoglobin by disrupting some genetic element. Um, there has always been also a goal of trying to directly correct sickle mutation. Um, while we're not able to do that, using a technology called base editors, we are able to convert sickle mutation to a non-pathogenic allele. And so base editors are also another very interesting new CRISPR um, genome editor. The idea is that you can use um, a nicking version of Cas9 to unwind the DNA. You can couple it to a deaminase domain that can make specific point mutations, in this case, A to G. And so here we can make a point mutation that converts sickle hemoglobin to hemoglobin caster. Um, and again, a summary, summary of the kind of results that we're seeing. So here we can have really efficient uh, base editing, around 87% of cells having more than one edited allele. Um, you can see that uh, a significant uh, amount of hemoglobin macassar um, in the blue and a five-fold reduction in sickling. And so these are both um, promising therapeutic approaches. So what about the safety of these approaches? Um, so one aspect that we've been thinking a lot about is how do we carefully understand the risks and benefits? So typically in this type of ex vivo editing, we're typically modifying hundreds of millions of cells. These edited cells might persist for years to a lifetime, and even low frequency of target mutations might be important if they induce some sort of cellular growth advantage. And so I think, you know, the question we're asking is, you know, are these cell therapies likely to be safe? Um, I think there's, so one thing that you would thought a lot about is um, lessons from gene therapy trials. And so there's earlier gene therapy trials like around 2002 for severe combined immunodeficiency using gamma retroviral vectors. And these trials resulted in T cell leukemia in five of 20 young patients. And so this was really a major setback for the gene therapy field around 20 or so years ago. And it was found that vector integrations near the LMO2 proto-oncogene were really responsible for these leukemias. And so this is something obviously that you know, folks um, working in the gene therapy and as well as genome editing fields really seek to avoid. It's not just um, a historical problem. There's also you know, recent concerns about this in sickle cell disease gene therapy trials. Um, so there's some recent trials by Bluebird Bio that were halted because of um, potential development of leukemias like AML and MDS. It seems like the vector is not related um, in those particular trials, but there's still a general concern about this. There was also a recent trial for cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy um, and in that case, it was clear that the lentiviral vector was associated with a leukemia. And so the safety of this is something that we're um, very interested in trying to make sure that the approaches are as safe as possible. So unlike gene therapy, there aren't clear integrations of um, the virus in gene editing for easy tracking. Um, so you can simply get small insertion or deletion mutations. And so we think that defining all target locations is really important, even if we can't currently interpret the function of many of these sequences. So you could get unintended um, edits somewhere in the genome. Um, we'd like to really define them as comprehensively as possible to enable monitoring for clonal expansion of cells that harbor some of these unintended edits. So essentially we want to know where are these edits um, do they expand over time? Could they be associated with some sort of risk of malignancy? Um, and so one of the fundamental questions we've asked is what's changed with genome editing? Um, so 
in addition to what you're doing at the on target site, what else are you doing in the genome? Uh, there are a number of different ways that people have approached this. One is the idea of performing in silico prediction and targeted sequencing. Um, this is something that's very simple to do. You can simply computationally predict sites. Um, the advantage is that it's very easy, but the disadvantage is that it's biased by your initial assumptions. Um, and so I'd like to use this cartoon to illustrate this idea. It's called the streetlight effect. And so you have a policewoman that comes to a man who's looking for his keys and she asks him, what are you doing? Um, and, and he says, I'm trying to find my keys. And so she says, is this where you lost them? He says, no, I think it was two blocks over. And then she says, then why are you looking for them here? Um, and he says, the light is so much better here. And so, you know, at first, this is kind of a ridiculous cartoon, but I think at the same time, um, it's very natural for uh, just people and scientists to look um, where the light is better. And so, you know, I think this is very similar to trying to understand the genome-wide activity of editors. So we and others use um, targeted sequencing and silico prediction to try to understand where genome editors were acting in the genome. But what we really need are approaches that are more global. Um, and so in this case, this is what's really motivated the development of sensitive, unbiased, and genome scale methods for understanding the global activity of genome editors. Um, there are a number of different approaches for doing this. This includes a number of cell-based methods as well as in vitro methods. Um, I don't have time to tell you about all of them here, but I will tell you about some of the ones that we've worked on recently that include GuideSeq, um, CircleSeq, and ChangeSeq. So one approach that many people initially think about when trying to understand the genome activity of editors is whole genome sequencing. But one of the challenges is that whole genome sequencing is really broad but shallow. It's impractical to sequence large numbers of genomes. So if you think about standard whole genome sequencing, you get a coverage of around 50x, which might be enough to detect a mutation frequency of around 5%, but not really low frequency mutations. And if you think about the fact that you're really treating potentially editing hundreds of millions of cells in these types of therapeutic approaches, it's, um, the sensitivity is just not good enough. So that motivated the development of a method that called GuideSeq, um, genome-wide and biased identification of double stranded breaks enabled by sequencing, um, which I led the development of when I was a postdoctoral fellow. So this is based on the principle of optimized tag integration um, of these short and protected um, DNA tags into the sites of nucleus and use double-strand breaks. So we can essentially tag these breaks with a short DNA tag. We then use them as an anchor to perform PCR to amplify out flanking genomic regions um, and then map them back to the genome. The advantage is that it's a really quantitative and unbiased method that you can really get the direct activity in cells, and it's really been broadly adopted for clinical genome editing assessment. So most of the therapeutic strategies right now have relied on um, this method. The limitations are that there are toxicity in certain cell types. Um, so cell types that we care about, like human hematopoietic stem cells, um, don't really tolerate integration of these tags. Um, so here's one of the first examples of GuideSeq genome-wide activity profiles that we generated. You can see the intended on-target site over here in green, um, and then unintended um, off-target sites here marked in red. And you can see over here in this bar plot on the right that there are a number of um, different sites where we saw a wide range of different genome-wide activities. So um, I'll point out that there are some that are really um, quite non-specific, um, but there were also some, I think this arrow is in, should be over here um, in RNF2, for example, where you have really high specificity. Um, so some advantages, as I mentioned, of GuideSeq are that it's quite quantitative. So here, um, for example, we're showing correlations between editing measured um, as indel mutation frequencies. Uh, versus GuideSeq read counts. And so you can see that they are highly correlated across a number of different sites. Um, but this also means that the ability to scale this method depends on linear increases in both sequencing and cell numbers. And so if you want to achieve higher sensitivity that becomes um, uh, more complicated, you simply need a lot more sequencing, a lot more cells. Um, and so in part, that's what motivated us to think about other methods of understanding genome-wide 
activity. We wanted um, an in vitro method, um, which has some potential advantages over cell-based methods. This includes that it's not dependent on transfection or transduction of cells. It's not dependent on DNA repair machinery um, for detection. It has the potential for high sensitivity um, and it's easy to automate and scale. So digenome seq is one of the earliest methods for defining genome-wide activity. This is developed by the lab of Jinsu Kim. It's based on the idea that you take whole genomic DNA, you treat it with a Cas9 genome editor um, as a ribonuclear protein complex, um, and then you perform essentially whole genome sequencing. The idea is that uh, at sites where the genome editor has activity, you'll end up with sites that have been cut um, and they'll have uniform ends when you map them back to the genome. And so the advantage is that it's very simple and PCR uh, free. The disadvantage is that you really require a really high number of sequencing reads um, to perform this method and that there's really high background. And so in thinking about this, we thought of a wish list for a novel high throughput method um, that would have meet some of these criteria. The idea is that we wanted to use very limited amounts of genomic DNA. Um, we wanted to really simplify the workflow. We wanted to have really low hands-on time and cost so that anyone could really do this. Um, we wanted equal or better sensitivity than earlier methods uh, and improve scalability and throughput. Um, and so in thinking about this, we thought that it was really resembled a situation that you know, all of us see in everyday life. This is, um, well, I guess everyday life before COVID. Um, and this is the idea of standing out from a crowd. So if you want to find a friend in a crowded place, you know, how do you normally go about doing that? Maybe you know, you'd know you wear a bright red sweater or you'd have a yellow umbrella. Essentially, you'd be different. Um, and so that's kind of what we we're trying to do also with a genome-wide activity of editor. We were trying to wonder you know, how could you make the activity of genome editors stand out um, in a sea of genomic DNA molecules. And so this is a challenge when you have a lot of genomic DNA, and you're simply trying to find those molecules that have been cut by Cas9. And so our solution was to make these molecules different by changing the topology of DNA. And so we invented methods. Uh, there's an earlier one uh, that I'm not going to go into called CircleSeq, um, and then now more recently a method that we call ChangeSeq. Um, and so the idea is that we have molecular biology um, using an enzyme called TN5 to insert adapters for circularizing um, genomic DNA. We use an exonucleus cocktail to degrade away linear, residual linear genomic DNA. And so we end up with a population of very pure genomic DNA in circles. Uh, we treat those purified genomic DNA circles with Cas9, and only circles that have been cut open will have ends that are available for adapter ligation and sequencing. Um, and so in this way, we're basically distinguishing between circular uncut genomic DNA and cut linearized genomic DNA to really find the sites um, that have been affected by Cas9. And so this is a method for selectively sequencing Cas9 um, or genome editor modified genomic DNA. Um, and so on the right, I guess we're showing some optimization of this. Um, this work was led by a really talented postdoc in my lab, Cesar Lazzarato. Um, it took, um, as you can see in this plot, um, a number of different trials to optimize the method, um, but we were able uh, to get a really pretty effective method. Um, on the bottom right panel is um, some atomic force microscopy images um, from our collaborators at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And so you can see some of the circular DNA um, before treatment with Cas9. Um, so change seek is a highly reproducible method. So here we're basically comparing two independent technical replicates. And so you can see we have pretty high correlations in read counts um, across a number of different sites, which is reassuring to see. Um, so then we took our method for high throughput profiling um, and applied it to around 110 different targets um, uh, in human primary T cells. And so here I'm showing you three sets of change seek data. These are Manhattan plots. So you can see on the top is a highly specific guide RNA, and on the bottom is Cas9 complex to a less specific guide RNA. The intended target site is marked with a red arrow. These are called Manhattan plots, which are organized by chromosomal location on the x-axis, and change seek read counts are on the y-axis. 
And so you can see there's some three examples here of pretty specific um, guide RNA targets and then examples of much less specific ones. Um, so we did this across 110 different therapeutic target sites and we identified around 202,000 um, unique off-target sites. Um, and I think you know part of the point is that you can find both very specific as well as non-specific targets. We wanted to use these large-scale data sets also to try to understand general principles that under that govern the specificity of these editors. And so one of the um, aspects was we also performed editing um, in human primary T cells. We compared editing activity um, as shown by indel mutation frequencies uh, against change seek specificity ratios. And so the ratio of the on to off target activity. And um, so you can see in the upper right here, we can find editors that are both highly active and highly specific. And so our analysis indicates that activity seems to be relatively independent of specificity, which is you know, pretty good for therapeutic applications. Um, our large scale analysis also revealed some factors associated with specificity. So we asked whether A, T, C, and G based frequencies in the target site had any association with overall specificity. Um, as well as the information content or the complexity of the target site um, and RNA secondary structure. The two that really contributed most to specificity were the frequency of Gs uh, in the targets, um, as well as the information content. So G-based frequency um, was positively correlated with number of change seek um, sites, and information content was negatively correlated. Um, this actually made a lot of sense to us because um, Gs can be associated with, for example, um, wobble mutations um, as uh, in tRNA codons and translation. Um, so that G um, wobble was you know, one potential explanation for why having more Gs made um, editors less specific. Um, and having more complex target sites, um, I think that also made a lot of sense to us too. Um, we asked whether change seek was more sensitive than guide seek, the cell based method. Um, so, we did this by performing a lot of targeted, multiplex targeted sequencing. Um, here, essentially, you can see in this bar plot, these are sites that are detected by both change seek and guide seek. And so, these validated with very high rates. We then binned the sites that were detected only by change seek into a number of different classes. And um, we did find that uh, ChainSeq detected sites that were not bona fide sites that could be validated in cells that were not detected by KiteSeq. Um, and so overall, our conclusion is that ChainSeq is more sensitive than um, the cell-based method. Uh, one other question that we had was, what is the relationship between these cellular and in vitro measurements? Um, so we kind of think that there's a set of sites that we can detect in these in vitro biochemical um, studies. Um, this might include some sites that can't actually be cut in cells. There are the sites that are actually edited um, in cells detected by direct cellular methods like GuideSeq. Um, and there's probably some intermediate ground truth, right? So there might be some sites that can't be detected by the cellular methods. Um, and so is there any way of trying to have some sort of prediction or understanding of the relationship between the in vitro and the cellular data. And I think at the end of the day, we really want to know what are the bona fide sites um, that could impact safety and which of these actually have a functional impact. Um, so to try to understand this, we looked at this in human primary T cells. We're performing matched guide seek, so cellular genome activity measurements, attack seek for understanding chromatin accessibility, and um, chip seek for looking at um, chromatin states. Um, and so what we found uh, in our profiling was that there we're basically looking at uh, enrichment for different histone modifications um, or changes in chromatin accessibility associated with guide seek cell based off targets versus um, a background defined by change seek or in silico prediction. And so there are certain marks, um, certain chromatin modifications like H3K4 trimethylation. Um, some DNA accessibility uh, markers that are enriched in these cellular op targets. And so I think the reassuring aspect um, here is that I think that there is some focusing of the genome-wide activity based on some of these epigenetic marks. Um, 
So we used these epigenetic marks to divide uh, the genome into a number of different chromatin states. And this is using something called a hidden Markov model. And then we're trying to, so these are divided into things like active promoters, strong transcription, active enhancers, um, and other uh, different parts of the genome. We then ask whether these different chromatin states are uh, associated with bona fide cellular um, genome-wide activities defined by GuideSeq. And so what we can see is that um, there are, there's about a two to four-fold enrichment of cellular activity um, in active chromatin states, like these active promoters and strong transcription. And so overall, I think it's, the good news again is that the genome-wide activity of editors is focused on certain parts of the genome. I think the bad news is that it does seem to be focused on important areas um, like active genes. Um, finally, we wanted to understand whether there's an effect of human genetic variation on the genome-wide activity of editors. To ask this question, um, we turned to uh, these genome in a bottle cell, cell lines um, that were defined initially by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And so I think these are some of the most sequenced genomes and well-characterized genomes in the world. We took seven genome in a bottle genomes at six targets with two replicates with around 84 change seq runs. Um, and so what we saw was that we could identify some sites where there are clear effects of genetic variation on activity. Um, so here I'm showing you some examples. So on the x-axis is change seq recounts. Here we have a particular off-target site um, and you have different genotypes. So this is um, someone that has an A in this particular position. Um, R stands for A and G, so it's a heterozygous sample and G is homozygous in the other direction. And so what you can see is that there's a clear quantitative relationship between um, the genotype and activity um, as defined by change seq. And so what's nice is that our unbiased approach doesn't require prior knowledge of the genome sequence of samples. You can directly understand whether the patient's genetic variation has an effect on the genome-wide activity. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears really quick and just um, go back to the therapeutic questions that we're talking about. So I've told you about a number of genome-wide activity assays for understanding um, the activity of potentially therapeutic editors. Um, and so here we're applying them back to some of the therapeutic editors that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, I'm going to start with the bad news and then uh, the good news. So here we're characterizing base editors that I mentioned to you um, for converting HBS um, into hemoglobin and macassar. Um, what we found was, um, as I mentioned before, so this was pretty effective in terms of converting um, sickle mutation to a non-pathogenic variant. Um, the bad news there was that we did find high frequency off-target activity. So you can kind of see um, this particular graph. This is on the y-axis, the number of validated off-target sites, um, and this is the percentage of mutations. And so you can see that there are some that had really quite high off-target activity, so like 50 to 100% efficiency. Um, some of these actually had higher off-target activity than the intended on-target site. Um, and on the right-hand side, there's a pie chart that kind of shows you the distribution of off-target activity um, according to different um, genomic annotations. So um, although there were no coding mutations, um, you know, they were distributed across these different areas. And so overall, this is an example of using genome-wide activity to understand a potentially therapeutic editor. And what it tells us is that for this particular editor, more work needs to be done. That uh, ideally, we'd really like to reduce the genome-wide target activity for these editors to something where there's no detectable target activity except at the on-target site. Um, in contrast, um, the good news is that for this gamma globin promoter targeted Cas9 ribonucleic protein complex, I think we did a lot better. So here again, I'm showing you some change seq data. You can see these Manhattan plots that are organized on the x-axis by chromosomal location. We see the on-target site marked um, by by the red arrow, and so you can see that there's some, but um, not as not very much genomic activity detected by the by the in vitro assay. And then we took the candidate sites for this, um, so around 209 sites, and performed targeted sequencing in edited human and metabolic stem cells. And so here's one panel of two of that targeted sequencing. What we found essentially was that we can see 
the intended on-target activity over here on the left, but uh, essentially no detectable off-target activity. Um, and so that was um, relatively encouraging for us. We're still doing more genotoxicity analyses on the site, um, but you know that was this was overall pretty encouraging for our group. Um, and so, as I mentioned, our goal is to open a clinical trial um, at St. Jude in 2022, um, hopefully around the end of 2022. We call this St. Jude Autologous Genome Edited Stem Cells, or SAGES-1. This would be a single infusion of autologous peripheral blood-derived CD34 hematopoietic stem cells edited at the HPG promoter by Cas9 RMP. Um, and this would be a phase one, two feasibility and safety study. Um, and so in sum, I just want to say that it's a really exciting time to advance novel curative genome editing therapies. Um, there's many approaches that are out there, and I think many more that are coming in the pipeline, um, both from other groups and as well as from our group here at St. Jude. Um, I would mention that, you know, this is not just my lab. This is a large um, multi-lab collaboration. Um, we have a sickle cell disease consortium here at St. Jude, um, including my department chair, Mitch Weiss. Um, so we've been really working on trying to advance these therapeutic approaches at St. Jude. Um, other points are that empirical methods like guide seek and change seek can guide the selection of most precise targets and editors in a really careful and rigorous way. I think that I typically like to take a very um, glass half full um, approach to genome wide activity. I think sometimes people see the data about the unintended activity of editors and jump to the conclusion that this is terrible news. And I think I like to take the opposite approach in that if we can really understand, carefully understand the genome wide activity of editors, we can really pick the best targets for therapeutic applications. Um, I think overall, these scalable um, high throughput approaches that we've developed might help us learn general principles about the genome-wide activity of editors. I didn't have time to show you, but we've also been working, we published um, in the Nature Biotech work that I showed, um, machine learning approaches to try to predict activity of editors. Um, you know, one gap um, that requires a, you know, that we've been thinking a lot about is the idea of trying to understand which, what, which subset of the genome-wide activity is really functional? Like what are the biological consequences? Um, and so I think ongoing research is required to understand functional and biological adverse effects, to understand the impact of human genetic variation, um, and then also to begin understanding new gen genome editors like base editors um, and prime editors. Okay, um, with that, I'd like to thank our funding sources, and this includes the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, um, the NIH Common Fund, uh, including the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Consortium, uh, St. Jude Children's Hospital. I'd like to thank members of my lab that have contributed to this work, a um, number of people at St. Jude, um, including Mitch Weiss, our collaborators. Um, I wanted to mention also that you know, our lab is recruiting um, new members at you know, multiple different levels. Um, and so if you're interested, please do feel free to reach out in my email is over here. Um, and then thank you again for your time and attention. I'm glad to take any questions. Great. Thank you. Yeah, if you have questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. I will be monitoring them both. We'll give people a minute. Mary, if you have a question, feel free to jump in. I'm just getting myself set up. Oh, sorry, there's a, uh, somebody asked, how do we go about getting involved? I think maybe in, in working there, I think that's the question. It just says, how do we go about getting involved? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. At working at St. Jude. Oh yeah. Um, I can stop my sharing. Oops. Okay. So, um, I think that, you know, there are, so St. Jude has a careers website. Um, and so I think, you know, there's, there are a number of opportunities to work at St. Jude. I think, you know, I think the most obvious one is working as I think like a research technologist is a position here. So it's something where you're able to work. Um, for example, in my group, we have research technologists that really work on projects very similar to graduate students. Um, so they're kind of like um, helping working with a postdoctoral fellow, for example. And so these kinds of positions can be found on the St. Jude website. Yeah, good question. Um, what inspired you to pursue this research? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I guess I can maybe start back as far as like when I was a graduate student. So when I was a PhD student, um, I worked in a lab of Jorge Piedra Gita, um, who worked on um, gene targeting in pigs. So actually like totally different area. Um, but working in the idea of like performing gene targeting by homologous recombination. Um, he, so Jorge was actually um, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Oliver Smithies, who wore, won the Nobel Prize for homologous recombination um, by gene targeting. Um, so we wanted to make gene targeted pigs um, for biomedical research, but this ended up being really quite hard because homologous recombination in um, cells that are not mouse embryonic stem cells um, is basically pretty inefficient. And so when I was a graduate student, I thought about, you know, okay, like, so what are methods um, to try to improve this? And I think one of the methods that was out there, um, but I didn't know anything about, was genome editing. So genome editing nucleases. And these were um, what I mentioned briefly in my talk, zinc finger nucleases at the time. And so I ended up doing a postdoc in the lab of Keith Shung, um, working on genome editors themselves. Uh, as a postdoc, when I was thinking about starting my own lab, I really wanted to do something at the intersection of both the technology, but also to have a clinical impact. Um, and so that's what really drew me to St. Jude. So I came to the Department of Hematology um, with the goal of working on at the intersection of both the technology, but also to move it forward in a therapeutic way. Great. So how many years you in, you, do you anticipate a cure for sickle cell disease through genome therapy? Yeah, um, so I think that, you know, we're very encouraged. So I think, you know, in our talk, I focused on this editing of the gamma gamma promoter. Um, there are active clinical trials um, editing BCL11A right now. And so there are some patients that have been responding really quite well um, to this type of approach. So basically, like, no, they've really reduced um, the potential symptoms of sickle cell disease. And so I think that we're basically at the point where this is quite possible and there's like a number of promising approaches. <laughs> a real personal question, but I think these are important questions because students want to know how to be you when they grow up. So they asked, how are your grades before grad school? I know it's important to make good grades to get into med school, but what helped you stay on track? Did you ever consider a major change? I would consider a major change. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, they want to know if you always knew what you wanted to be from the time you were little, and yeah. you were always great at this genome editing thing. Right. And so it was like smooth sailing for you, or was yeah. it like a little bit of? <laughs> so, I, so I'm afraid to say that um, I didn't know that I wanted to be a genome editor since, like, you know, I was like eight years old or something like that. I know that sometimes, you know, I'm on the graduate admissions committee at St. Jude, and you know, sometimes you see. <laughs> You see essays where people are like, I've known forever. And I, I don't think, I mean, it wasn't like that um, for me. When I was an undergrad, um, I initially started as a chemistry major. Um, I ended up, um, you know, liking biology and ended up being a double major in chemistry and biochemistry. Um, I had an interest in, um, in computers um, and programming at that point. Um, and so that's kind of like what drew me to the genetic sciences program at NC State, where I did my PhD. I kind of wanted to combine some um, computational expertise along with my science background. You know, there was the human genome sequencing, you know, that had been um, done around that time. And so I think, you know, that's what drew me to genomics. Um, and I mentioned kind of like the transition to, um, from gene targeting to genome editing. I think that um, for me, you think about the things that you're interested in and you kind of like, you know, continue to try to like pursue and focus on them, but I don't think, at least for me, you know, I didn't know everything about it from, from the beginning. I think you just kind of um, keep trying to um, pursue your interests. Yeah, like by attending seminars like this and seeing what else is <laughs> out there and meeting cool people who have opportunities and taking chances and uh, yeah, you'll find it. Good questions. Um, all right, back to science. Do you know the major approach differences uh, of CRISPR therapeutic, Vertex Farm, and your method on sickle cell treatment? 
Are there oh, yeah, that's a great there? that's a great question. Um, so you know, I didn't get into the details um, in the talk, but so um, there are basically. So I mentioned to you kind of like the separation between the gene correction approaches um, and the approaches that are for induction of fetal hemoglobin. Um, within the induction of fetal hemoglobin, there are two major therapeutic targets on the editing level. So one of them is this CRISPR therapeutics target. Um, the target is a red blood cell specific enhancer of this um, protein called BC11A. Um, the reason that you can't target BC11A directly in human hematopoietic stem cells because it causes a stem cell defect. Um, and so basically they're targeting a regulatory element of that protein. Um, but the overall effect is to essentially reduce uh, or knock out that repressor. Um, our approach is to knock out the repressor binding site. Um, so we think that this is one of the most downstream targets. So we're not actually manipulating the expression of this repressor that might have other functions um, in, does have other functions in stem cells and might have other functions in red blood cells. Um, we're basically editing the very downstream target. And so there's the potential that it could be more biologically specific. Um, both of these approaches do seem to be able to in, induce pretty high levels of fetal hemoglobin. Um, and so I think they're both you know, pretty promising targets. What is the most challenging part of your research to understand? Challenging part to understand. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of challenging parts, I think. Um, if I were to pick, I mean, I guess like out of, out of the things that I've presented today, um, I think, you know, one major unsolved problem is understanding um, the functional genome-wide activity of editors. So I showed you a lot of data on, we can find where the mutations are, um, we can find real mutations with great sensitivity. I think um, a big question for us in, in the field is like, you know, what do those mutations mean, right? Um, and this is really important in the context of sickle because um, there have been cases where patients on sickle cell disease gene therapy trials have developed um, acute myeloid leukemia um, or MDS, these leukemias. It seems like they weren't associated with um, the gene uh, therapy vector, as I mentioned, but it does seem like they're associated with these pre-existing mutations that happen um, in the patients. So these are uh, mutations that are associated with something called clonal hematopoiesis. And so I think in general, understanding um, the risk that certain mutations might cause leukemias, for example, in these patients is something that um, is very urgent for us to understand. Mm -hmm. All right, another question. Any advice for getting started working with hidden Markov models? <laughs> um, that's a good technical question. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, um, I mentioned um, the hidden Markov model thing as part of uh, my description of, I think, the chromatin state um, aspect. Um, I'm not an expert in hidden Markov models. Um, I think so. Um, I think that, you know, if you're, you know, I guess like, you know, if you look for people that are working, I think um, there is a machine learning, for example, um, you know, that would probably be a good way of um, thinking about it. I think there are also a lot of um, new machine learning um, techniques that might also be very interesting to, um, to think about and look into. You know, I think that you, you may have heard of things like um, deep mind, these like deep neural networks. Um, and so there's a lot that's being done in this, in this area, right? Like, you know, from, um, I think I mentioned that little overview um, before of machine learning for things like full self-driving. Um, there's a lot that's been done in the AI field. And I think that there's a lot that can be done in application to science. Along those lines, maybe sort of, is there a job for a computational chemist in these types of research fields? Computational chemist. Computational um, chemist. She says she's asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, you know, I think that um, there's definitely, um, you know, the computational expertise, I think, in general, is something that's becoming more and more valuable. I think that as we work with more genomic data sets, um, 
I think you know there's the opportunity for high throughput analyses. I think we're trying to interpret what these things mean. Um, there could be um, screens that are done in the context of small molecules, for example, that could be very interesting. I think you know one aspect that I didn't really of our research that I didn't touch on in this talk is I think the idea of trying to improve or better control the DNA repair outcomes of editors. Um, so I think you know that touches on I think the um, the correction of sickle mutation that I, that I mentioned before, right? So like we can make targeted double strand breaks, but we can't really control the repair outcomes afterwards. Um, and so I think screens of small, small molecules in the context of editing, you know, these are all things that maybe a computational chemists could help with. So I'm going to ask a more challenging question in reference to the conversation we had earlier about ethics and Clearly CRISPR and genome editing is, is a bit controversial when it comes to what should and should not be allowed, right? So when this came out as a possible technology, it was like everything could change now, right? You could go edit embryos, you can cure all this human disease. And of course there are limits to what can be done. And then there are also limits to what should be done. Um, so I don't necessarily, I'm not going to ask your opinion, but you are part of a field that probably has these discussions. What is the, what is the the feeling these days on what can and should be allowed with this technology? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question, right? Because um, I think, for example, CRISPR genome editors. I think you know one of the main aspects is that they're so simple to program and they're quite robust, um, and I think that that really opened up the technology to just thousands of people. Um, so, you know, one of my roles is I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the steering committee of the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Consortium. Um, this is an NIH consortium. And I think you know, that consortium was very um, carefully named the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Consortium because of the focus on editing of somatic and not germline cells. Mm -hmm. So not, um, you know, no designer babies as a kind of like part of Part of that process. I think um, maybe part of my work might have highlighted the fact that we don't have perfect understanding of the safety or genome-wide activity of editors, even in a somatic cell genome editing context. And if you were to consider doing this in a way that could be heritable, you know, from like, you know, one generation to the next, that's something that I think you would need to proceed with extreme humility and caution. And so I think like, you know, that's probably, you know, the first um, thing that, you know, I would mention about that. Um, I think the boundaries, like for at least current signs are really pretty clear. We're focused on somatic cell genome editing um, ther therapies, but not on germline editing. Now, I think um, it's definitely possible to understand, you know, case, I think that there are a lot of cases in terms of um, where people have thought about germline genome editing, you know, for correction of disease mutations, a lot of these probably could be addressed by in vitro fertilization and screening. Um, so, but you can like conceive of, you know, very, these like very boundary, boundary cases where there's two parents, you know, with a homozygous mutation, homozygous mutations for some sort of disease allele and they still want to have kids. And so you, I think you can empathize with those cases, but still understand that, you know, we don't know a lot about this, um, the safety of technology and like, the consequences of that, I think, in the long term, would really have to be considered. Yeah. It's complicated. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other questions that the audience has to type in? We'll give you another minute to put those in. And it is interesting. I didn't pick up on that committee that you're part of, that it's, I read somatic and didn't think like, oh, well, that's, means that there's nothing of uh, germline going on, but that makes sense and that is responsible. Yeah, I think the NIH, um, you know, I think they funded probably like 45 or so different groups. Um, you know, it's a relatively large consortium, but I think they just really wanted to emphasize that it's focused on somatic and not germline genome editing. Yeah. Any more questions, guys? Well, we appreciate this very much. 
Thank you for, for giving the seminar today and sharing your work with us. Um, you might hear from some of these students. Oh, there's a raised hand. Then you got to type your question in. Can't <laughs> if, she's, if she really wants to ask something here. Um, but yeah, so, so appreciate it. And uh, if she sends me a question, I'll let you know. <laughs> she knows how to find me. Um, yeah, and so thank you again, Dr. Sai, and uh, some of us will see you in the morning uh, for one more visit. Appreciate your time. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Great. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I'll see some of you tomorrow. <laughs>